Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alice Maggio, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Uh, from 2012 to 2017, I worked at the Schumacher Center working on the local currency program Berkshires, and I now serve on the board of directors of the Schumacher Center. I'm pleased to welcome you all today to today's installment of a series of conversations that the Schumacher Center has been hosting throughout the summer in which we invite past Schumacher lecturers to reflect on how their thinking has evolved since they delivered their lectures. The series is of course being organized in anticipation of the 40th year of the annual Schumacher lectures. This year, the event will be held on Sunday, October 25th and will feature speakers Kali Akuno and George Monbiot. The lectures will be held online, which we hope will allow many more people to participate. You can find more information about the Schumacher Lectures on our website, um, centerforneweconomics.org. Today, our guests are Neva Goodwin and Stuart Wallace, who both delivered Schumacher Lectures in 2010. I will briefly introduce Neva and Stuart, and then I'll invite them to each share their opening remarks, followed by a conversation, and then we'll turn to questions from our audience. And you can submit those questions through the question and answers box. Um, the chat box will be disabled for this webinar, um, but you can, you can communicate through the question and answer box. And we will try to consolidate those questions and then I will share them with our panelists. Finally, we'll turn to our guests for their concluding remarks. Um, so we'll get started and I will start by introducing Neva Goodwin. Neva Goodwin seeks ways to translate an understanding of the economy in its full social and ecological context into action and policy. She follows on the ground experiments in alternative socioeconomic institutional design and is involved with efforts to motivate businesses to build social and ecological health into their corporate goals. Her lifelong involvement with the care and management of natural environments and awareness of the onrushing crises of the 21st century have turned her attention from economics per se to the possibility of ecological restoration to halt and turn around humanity's headlong slide into disaster. From 1995 to 2019, Dr. Goodwin was co-director of the Global Development and Environment Institute, a research in university at Tufts University. There she worked to systematize and institutionalize and economic theory, contextual economics, that has more relevance to contemporary real world, world concerns than does the dominant economic paradigm. Much of this work has now moved to the Economics in Context Initiative at Boston University. Dr. Goodwin's work in economics has included editing more than a dozen books, and she is the lead author of three introductory economics textbooks, which have been translated and used around the world. Our second panelist, a guest today, is Stuart Wallace. And Stuart is currently the chair of We All, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. We All is the leading global collaboration of organizations, alliances, movements, and individuals working together to transform the economic system into one that delivers human and ecological well being. Previously, he was the executive director of the New Economics Foundation for 12 years and the international director of Oxfam. Great Britain for 10 years. Prior to this, he spent seven years with the World Bank in Washington, working on industrial and financial development in East, East Asia, and 13 years working in business, including leading a successful turnaround of a 1,000 employee business. Stewart has a master's degree from Cambridge and London Business School, an honor honorary doctorate from Lancaster University, and was awarded the OBE for services to Oxfam. He is also chair of the Conservation Farming Trust and co-author of a recently published A Finer Future. Welcome to both of you and thanks for being here. So I will turn to you now to ask you for your opening remarks, thinking back to your 2010 Schumacher lecture. How would you update that lecture now or what are your thoughts when you look back and see what you were thinking about in 2010? I will turn to Neva first um, and please share your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, 10 years ago when I tried to imagine the year 2075, I thought that assuming a life expectancy of 80, anyone 25 or younger was likely to be alive in that year. 
This now becomes highly relevant to all of you who are 35 or younger, and to all of our children and grandchildren. But I'm afraid I'm going to start by saying some of the hard to face things that I admitted 10 years ago. In my talk, then, I hinted that we can simply cannot continue our present trajectory of, on the one hand, population growth, and on the other, ecological destruction. By now, this twin trajectory has us on course for widespread famines caused by a warming climate, along with shortages of clean, fresh water, and destruction of soil fertility through modern farming practices. When people are faced with disastrous shortages of food or water, they don't stay still, they migrate. There will be other reasons for migration, often cause or an effective famine. Weather is one, not just heat waves and massive storms, but also fires and floods. And the sea level rise that threatens huge portions of the global population. Uh, out of the world's 20 largest cities, 15 are located either on the ocean or on river deltas. The response to migration could be generous assistance from the rich countries, or it could be walls and weapons. More often than not, resource shortages have a history of provoking conflict rather than care. Our current course is headed for war as well as famine. A funny book is a good thing in these times. Uh, in Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, pollution has joined the horsemen of the apocalypse, quote, having taken over when pestilence muttering about penicillin had retired in 1936. Unfortunately, we still have both pollution and other environmental ills coexisting with COVID-19 as just the latest in a series of diseases which have emerged the territory or newly adapted to human beings as we fill ever more of the earth. The topic of population brings up a nice irony. The populations of the poor countries are continuing to grow, while those of the rich countries are clearly moving towards decline, some already re being reduced. This will shift the composition of the world's population away from those of European ancestry, a reverse of what occurred during the 18th and 19th centuries when Europeans and their descendants experienced a relative increase throughout much of the world. Perhaps we could view this as the ultimate form of decolonization. I'll mention the disaster scenario just once more, bef more before I try to brighten the picture a little. Climate change, where a lot of the momentum is unstoppable, can be expected to cause resource shortages, famine, disease, sea level rise, and extreme weather events. The way that humanity chooses to respond to these likely disasters include, for example, war. But they can also include the mobilization of people who are awakening to what really matters to them. What I found to be the most encouraging concept in recent years has been the idea of ecological restoration. I hadn't even heard that term until a few years ago. And when I heard it and learned just a little about what was involved, I was electrified. We can undo some of the harm that we've done to our planet. In fact, given knowledge and understanding, which are mounting up very rapidly, there's enormous scope for healing the earth and healing ourselves at the same time. What is especially encouraging is that investments of time and resources in ecological restoration pay off in a wide variety of ways. For example, there's huge potential for plants and other natural systems to capture from the air and store in the soil very significant quantities of the carbon that has been admit, emitted during the industrial era. The unfortunate coziness between the oil and gas industry and our politicians has been distorting this potential, trying to put away from natural methods of carbon capture and storage towards hugely expensive counterproductive ways of extracting carbon directly from the air and then storing it sometimes in oil wells where it will help to extract the last hard to extract bits of petroleum. Natural methods go far beyond planting trees. One of the most important is the turn towards regenerative agriculture. 
When we stop poisoning the soil with agrochemicals, we do a lot of good things. We improve human health because these chemicals are harmful, whether they reach us through the food we eat or through the water into to which they have run off. We improve soil health, encouraging the return of microorganisms that significantly affect the nutritive value of the food we eat. Healthier soil is able to store far more carbon. It also helps crops survive during droughts, as well as being a sponge that can absorb water and reduce flooding. Ecological restoration is labor intensive. It can provide good jobs that also improve people's health because they're working in natural settings, even if this is an urban park, and doing something they can feel good about. We're all becoming acutely aware of what it takes for people to survive in very hard times. The global pandemic has made it evident that caring government action is required when jobs are lost. A natural response is to look for a jobs program and ecological restoration, outdoors work that is clearly for the public good, is natural. But I would like to set this idea alongside the broader notion that more jobs are better per se. In fact, many jobs in our current economy are producing goods and services that are in fact bads and disservices. In fact, the crisis of ecological destruction with climate change, the largest element, is a direct result of an economic system that promotes ever more of everything, production and consumption, profits and jobs. Farm systems that can sustain the total human population will not come out of our current version of a capitalist socio-economy. They will only pr be promoted and indeed allowed to replace dominant unsustainable systems of industrial agriculture when power, political and economic power, is aligned with the concept of well-being. The justification given for capitalism is that it's so productive, it produces a whole lot of goods and services. Why is that good? The justification has been to increase consumption in order to increase well-being. The identification of well-being with consumption is great for producers because it liberates them to do what will most increase their profits, that is, to create a consumer society where people are manipulated to want whatever the producers produce and to live in a perpetual state of dissatisfaction, always wanting more. We come back again and again to coalitions of power. In the United States, starting with the Constitution, there was a strong political bias toward the owners of property. That bias has drifted towards corporations, not even necessarily their owners, but rather to the managers, usually, who are in a position to hand out large amount of money to influence governments. A cleaving of the relationship between corporations and government, a separation of business and state, to follow the original idea of separating church and state, would open the door to many other possibilities. The idea of re-examining corporate charters to assist that they include sustainable human well-being as a prime goal is just one of the ideas that would then be possible. Rechartering corporations and cutting their unwholesome ties with governments, applying the right kinds of methods to remove atmospheric carbon, rapidly moving to regenerative agriculture, creating a global culture of ecological restoration, recognizing essential work, and creating jobs that are good for the worker and for society. These are the directions we should be going. Not easy to know how to do it. I asked to speak before Stuart so that he could be the one to talk about how to get there. Thank you, Neva. Stuart, would you like to take it away? Sure, no pressure, Neva. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my original lecture, I very much spelt out what was wrong with the current economic system. And like Neva, I've been arguing for a long time for a change to a different system. And I tried to spell out also the key dimensions of that system. But I was fairly brief on the how. And that's probably the area that I'd like to talk about most. But a couple of other things I would change from my original um, presentation. Um, 
in my original diagnosis of the problems, I said I use something called the four U's, that we've got an economic system that's unsustainable, unfair, unstable, and making far too many people unhappy. Now, all those apply, and if anything, much more on almost all those dimensions. But the two things that I would emphasize even more than I did then were, uh, first of all, what Nevis pointed to, not just, which I did cover, what's happening on climate change and what's happening to ecosystems, but what's happening to biodiversity and species loss. I mean, only today, the World Wildlife Fund has put out a report saying that in the last 50 years, the actual number of animals on the planet has gone down by two thirds. It's, it's massive. And we see the same in biodiversity loss across all sorts of other um, non-animal species, plants, etc. So I'm totally with um, Neva that a crucial issue is the whole issue of regeneration. I find increasingly that I get very impatient with the world's sustainability. We shouldn't be sustaining what was happening now, we need to regenerate it. And that's the point Neva's made very powerfully. And, and that's about farming, it's about how we eat, it's the soil, it's water, it's our air, all those areas. Um, we need to regenerate our natural world. The second thing I would have put more emphasis on, I covered unhappy and why um, the economic more and more activity wasn't leading to greater well-being for people. But what I didn't emphasize enough is how many people now feel invisible. They feel of no importance. Um, they feel not valued or valuable. Uh, they feel their voice is unheard. And that is an absolute crisis in running out in many dimensions, both those groups that have been um, discriminated against for many, many years, talk, think Black Lives Matter, think what Me Too is talking about, but also many other people who increasingly feel they are of no value, they're not valued by the system. And Sebastian Younger, who was the author of a book called Tribe, um, said something that was, I think, very pertinent. Humans don't mind hardship. In fact, they thrive on it. What they mind is not feeling necessary. And modern society has perfected the art of making people not feel necessary. And I think there's a very big element of truth in that. And Michael Sandel, the Harvard philosopher, has also just put out a book called The Tyranny of Merit, that even the liberals, you know, so under Obama or in the US or um, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown in the UK, there's been this sense that education, higher education is, which I think is very important, but it's the route to um, being valued, um, being seen with esteem being counted of importance and people who for no fault of their own because of the wider circumstances haven't been able to compete and meet the things that most kids now have to go through the sort of almost tyranny of exams um, feel of, again of no value and that's been a big factor I think in things like the Brexit debate in the UK of people just feeling cut out of the economy. Um, and so when we talk about um, needing, as I do a lot, needing to deal with inequality, I think it's crucial not just to talk about inequalities of wealth, um, not just inequalities of income, not just inequalities of power, but also inequalities of esteem. And I think that whole area of who we esteem and who we count as valuable is critical and runs behind a lot of other issues in our societies today. The second thing that I would change, I talked about five criteria for a good economy. Some of them are, I would stay the same. I, I argue that a good economy um, needs to meet human needs across all the different dimensions and focus on those ahead of human wants. I second have argued for fairness, and I've just talked about that. Um, and, but then I talked about living within ecological limits. And again, I would have widened that now to talk about regenerating the natural world, revering it and realizing that uh, we are 
part of nature and we depend on it. So, but whether we, even if we depend on it, nature of its own needs to be revered and respected in its own right, let alone how it's useful to us, even about how we live on it, with it. But again, based on what I was saying about pe how people feel, a third area, so I would say human needs, fairness, in which is much greater, better distribution of income, wealth, power, um, esteem and time. Respecting and cherishing and regenerating the natural world would be my third key area. But then two about people and your, uh, the right economy, a well-being economy has to make people feel valuable and linked to a common purpose. And similarly, our institutions, which comes a bit back to what Neville was talking about in terms of charters, our institutions of all types have to be serving the common good. And I think that's critical. And then finally, and increasingly important, people also need to feel their voices heard and have a sense of control over their lives. Those seem to me the dimensions of an economy that um, in short would meet human and ecological well-being. But that brings my final point, and just touching now on the how, is strangely, and you would think I'm mad or Pollyanna-ish, um, I actually feel more hopeful than I did 10 years ago. And let me explain why. I'm more hopeful that economic system change can be achieved and a bit clearer, though I wouldn't pretend to be any, you know, one still finding one's way a bit, but a little bit clearer on the how. And this isn't a Pollyanna-ish thing. I still get very, you know, as many days I get out of bed and think, no, this is hopeless. So it's not that I don't see the dark side of all the things that we do see, but overall, most times I feel hopeful. And that's because I think I've got a much greater sense of some of the things that are necessary for system change. When I was at the New Economics Foundation, we believe that doing really good research, communicating in fun and interesting ways, um, lobbying politicians behind the door, closed doors, but also campaigning with allies uh, out in the open and working with communities and others to try out new models in practice. Those were the conditions for change. And we achieved all sorts of policy change. We got the Cameron government in UK together with other allies. It's never one organization or one people alone to start measuring well-being as a headline measure. We thought that might shift the system, but it didn't. And so increasingly made me throw back to what are the conditions for system change? And all those things I've mentioned are necessary, but three crucial things are also necessary. And whether you look at the anti-slavery movement, the civil rights movement, or whether you look at the two big changes in Western economies in the 20th century to Keynesianism mid-century into neoliberalism in the late in sort of 70s, late 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties. You see similar though different uh, key factors and those factors are a vanguard power movement of people working across sectors, across geographies and across levels, not bottom up or top down but both, who come together to argue for a different system and to influence others. Secondly, a new story that's based on who we are, truly are as humans. You can have all sorts of false stories as we only know too well. And thirdly, that the economics of the system you're talking about is clearer to people and is easier communicated and is available to policymakers. And that's why in 2018, I came out of retirement to help work with many other people to create something as called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance or we all. And the fascinating thing in just two years, now about 170 different organizations, movements, um, coalitions are part of this. They've said, and the whole basis in which we try to work together are people who believe in system change and are prepared to work on the level of goals, values and principles rather than arguing about a, po a particular policy issue. So cooperation is more important than agreement on the detail. Um, something like 
150 academics are now involved in different levels. Neva, I'm glad to say, is one of our ambassadors, which is wonderful. We've got a citizens movement that's very embryonic, but about 1800 change makers across the world are involved in that. I've got a youth movement starting on four continents. And very importantly, some of my colleagues have managed to work with a number of governments to create something called the Wellbeing Economy Governments Partnership. That currently is four countries, New Zealand, Scotland, Iceland, and Wales, but about seven others are in very interested in joining, including some quite big countries and big economies. And that is a group of countries that are trying to implement a different economic system at scale. And I can say much more about it in the questions answered, which is useful. But the very fact that we got a living laboratory at scale, it's risky, it may or may not get the breakthroughs we want, but there are governments now committed to doing, to trying to implement a different economic system. And the idea of a well-being economy has really taken off. I think I've gone on too long, but that's the um, reason why quietly, given that sort of real flourishing of activity, I see some way to shift the needle. It will take a long time before it shifts through into political change, and we don't have much time, but I wouldn't, sometimes things happen much quicker than you think, and I have no idea whether this will really take off or not, but I am quietly hopeful. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Neva. Um, so I will kick us off with a question. Um, it seems to me that both of you have thought a lot about how there are myths and kind of constructions of thinking that really define how um, the outcomes that we have. And actually often we think about actions or policies being the things that create consequences in our world. Um, but I know in Stuart, in your Schumacher lecture, you talked about how actions filtered through belief systems are what actually lead to consequences. And I wondered, um, as you've demonstrated, your own thinking has evolved in the last 10 years. Um, and I wondered if you could pick out some things that you've noticed in the world about uh, where other people's thinking and maybe like our general, even our myths or our underlying paradigms have shifted. If you can think about some specific examples where you've seen that start to move. I mean, I think in this dreadful pandemic, I think, and as you probably, I think it's been handled differently in the US from Britain, but we shut down pretty completely. And literally most people were at home. Um, most people, you know, transport stopped, all sorts of things stopped. Um, socializing stopped. And there was a time also where there were so few cars on the road. There were so, people just weren't moving. And what people have said, and you hear this time and time again, is we suddenly started appreciating nature. Now, whether that will last, because there's a danger, just that everybody, some people, especially our current government, are trying to get back as fast as possible to business as usual, which is the last thing we should be doing. Um, but you hear time and time again people saying how much they suddenly got an appreciation of the natural world. But also the realization that I think a lot of people do realize that this virus came from animals. Um, you know, the path isn't always totally clear, but there's more and more evidence that we're going to face more and more uh, zootic viruses um, of this sort of type if we keep tre treating animals, keep farming in the same way you do, and keep cutting down habitats. And so I think there is a realization, Alice, that we are part of nature. There's more of a realization. It's not, it's more widespread than it was and that we depend on it. I think that is something that, we, the other thing I think that's, this dreadful pandemic has certainly in the UK has helped people realize is who are the key workers? Because it has been the people who still kept working, the hospital porters, the people who, um, have delivered the food to the old people. That, that sense of who we really value, and it's almost, not totally in the case of doctors, it's not the true, 
but in many cases, they're some of the lowest paid, the care workers and the care homes, etc. And again, I think people have realized that our system of paying you know, people, that was one of the original myths I talked about, that, um, that how much people were paid equals their value. It doesn't equal their value. It equals their scarcity in uh, rather messed up markets. Um, so I think those sort of things are realized. And also the fight, what's really important, you know, I think, there's a picture of my four grandchildren behind them and I'm, I haven't been able to give them a hug. Those are some of the important things and so many people speak that. So I think there's a possible reset that will help in trying to get at what is re what's really important for us. But there's huge risk because there's other people out there who still want to get back to business as usual who are very threatened by um, some of these trends. And so this is not going to be simple, but um, those would be some of the, you know, the appreciation of nature, the appreciation of community and who are our key workers and how do we value them, I think, are some of the things that, are, that people are starting to get. So that sense of, and the way that well, the concept of a well-being economy, and I used to do a lot on, on measuring well-being, but Neva is one of those people for a long time has been talking about the well-being economy. And I think that is also the amount of media that's been on well-being economy it does seem to sum up that an economy that's basically designed to um, look after both people and the planet from the start rather than uh, as neva's already said trying to desperately grow something and thinking that's going to translate in the same thing whereas it doesn't at all so um i think those are some of the things i'd point to alice thank you neva do you have thoughts about think have you noticed certain myths that are seem to be crumbling or m moments that this kind of the dominant paradigm might be cracking. I've been keeping my eye on the economics profession uh, because I've been trying to change it for my whole professional life. And um, it's not changing as fast as I would like, of course. Uh, but I think there is more questioning of whether what people learn in economics courses is true. There's, you know, the economics courses tell us that the economy is a separate entity from society, the culture, and the ecology. And we've certainly recognized that those things are integrally in, involved and uh, affect one another. I also, similar to Stuart, I was so excited to see the term essential worker come out. And I would love to see essential work elevated as a phrase that nobody ever forgets. The yes. reason I went into economics a long time ago was because I was wondering why are the people who do the things that are absolutely essential for our lives and our comfort and our existence, why are they the least paid? mothers, care workers, nurses, lower school teachers, and of course, people who produce food. So um, it's a completely upside down system of reward. And in terms of how change can come about, I'm hopeful that the system of reward is going to change, that uh, it will be possible to pay an awful lot less to the people who are raking in the millions and the billions. And that money can be used to pay the essential workers of the world. So we have a question from our audience. Um, it's, it is a kind of tricky question. We're talking about a well-being economy where, um, where people feel valued and have value. Um, and are rewarded for their work. So the question is, how do we shift towards a more environmentally regenerative and economically equitable economy while still allowing people to act out their individual desires? Gosh. You want to go first on that, Neva? All right. Uh... I don't actually see a conflict. 
I think the point is that we've been sold the idea that the kind of uh, economy we have now is one that al allows people freedom of choice. Um, you're free to work or starve. You're free to buy everything that you happen to have enough money for. But you aren't free very much to escape from the influences of the producers, the corporations, who, if I can escape from it, can I help my children escape from it or my grandchildren? I've been lecturing my oldest granddaughter on the consumer society and she laughs at me yeah. while, <laughs> while being a part of it, but I'm hoping to make headway there. But I don't see actually that there is a lessening of freedom if we change those who make the rules from the corporations to entities that are probably going to look like governments, but they may be at local levels. They'll be at a variety of different levels. There's a big myth that government regulation takes away freedom. I won't go on at great length about that, but in fact, when you don't have government regulation, then uh, polluters are free to pollute and other people are free to suffer from it. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you, Neva. I don't think there's necessarily um, a conflict. Um, where, and I think when you, talk to people around the world and I used to do that a lot in my Oxfam job and but I'm still keeping in touch with people who are doing all sorts of surveys and sort of asking people what they want and actually what I described as elements of a well-being economy fit very closely with what people say they want. Of course as Neva says you can temporarily you know my I, my um one of my grandchildren has just become a teenager. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure I'll be facing some of the same dialogue with her <laughs> in due course. But I think realistically though, there will be some constraints at some point on, for instance, how much we can travel around the world until certainly until we can um, find ways to do so in an ecologically safe way, which is not very clear at the minute. Um, and things that have either high waste content or high content of non-renewables materials of one form or another will get and need to get much more expensive. And that is, that is where tax, you know, taxes need to shift from value added and um, labor and things like that onto um, financial transactions onto um, non-renewables, onto wastes. Um, we need a very big shift in our taxation system and that will cut down certain types of consumer goods, but we'll, the evidence is not quite often that those particular goods make a lot of difference to people's well-being. In fact, um, it's very questionable indeed how much difference they make. So I think in terms of people's well-being, um, they may not get Want be able, there may be limits on certain things they want that they may not they may have been able to get and they can't anymore. You know, I think the market in luxury yachts in my world would be um, a very limited one or, or non-existent one. So yeah, if you want a, a super yacht, then bad luck. But uh, many other things that really matter to people, I think, will be still available. So the trade-off is not massive. Thank you. We have another question um, asking about, and I think this goes to some of the work that Stuart talked about when uh, talking about the government alliance working with we all. Um, what are some of the government actions or campaigns that are most successfully pressing to implement a shift towards a well being economy or a more environmentally regenerative economy. And that's what I was actually wondering about that if you could give some examples of policy that that these governments are considering implementing or are implementing. Sure. I mean, first thing to say, they're only, you know, even New Zealand is only about a year into adopting this. So 
you aren't seeing a magical transformation yet. But it's very interesting. Last year, New Zealand, if I give that one example, um, implemented the first well-being budget, which the way they did that was setting out some really critical areas they thought were important for both human and ecological well-being and then working across government to decide the priorities um, for where they were going to spend their money. So for example, um, child mental health was one area that they put a lot of money into. Secondly, into regeneration and, um, and carbon-free transport, um, regeneration of wetlands, things like that. And, and thirdly, into indigenous rights and um, supporting Maori and other groupings. So they focus that budget quite directly on areas that they thought were most important to the people of well-being in, um, in New Zealand. In Scotland, um, do look at the First Minister's um, TED talk, um, which has been probably now looked at a huge number of times, I think it's something like two million times. Um, she was, she's very explicit again what a well-being economy would look like in Scotland and as a result of that Scotland last year implemented some of the uh, most rigorous climate change legislation in the world so that's another example of what they're doing Iceland has similarly got a well-being economy framework Wales though it's very early days has implemented something which is about the well-being of future generations trying to make sure that the current generation doesn't steal from future generations, whether ecologically or otherwise. But this was something that isn't well enough proven yet, but I would certainly postulate, and there's, there's anecdotal evidence, even if it hasn't been shown rigorously, that one of the reasons New Zealand has dealt with the COVID crisis as well as it has, despite what Trump has been trying to say about um, that their handling of coronavirus is because a they have a very a very enlightened and wise female leader but secondly because they would focused already on well-being because they've been thinking about human well-being ecological well-being they've organized their budget like that i think they immediately focused on some of the critical things that were needed um, they took very much, they took drastic action about people coming in and out of the country, but they really focused on um, the health, the human well-being, the mental health issues. And I think that's why they've managed to get a, a, a much better um, response to, I mean, they're, they're obviously aided by being an island, but um, we're an island in the UK as well, and that hasn't helped us very much, but New Zealand it did. Um, so yeah, so I think those are some of the examples. I would pick up and interestingly the Scottish example for example one of the things that's helped Scotland is that there's been a upswelling of people um, for instance Wellbeing Alliance Scotland which is its own separate or charity has people from the environment groups from community groups from you know um, universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow it's uh, it's got businesses involved, it's got finance houses involved, it's people coming together across sectors to say we can do this economy differently. So they're now thinking out how they can um, both create good green jobs, good jobs of the type that Neva was talking about, and get themselves off their oil dependence, which is a huge issue in Scotland. Um, so they're thinking through that. New Zealand's trying to look at how it does tourism sustainably and gets off for some of its agriculture um, um, reliance. So there's some really tough issues coming they've got to deal with, but those are but the signs are that A, they've set themselves up to set the right indicators and goals, and that already you can see action when it's on climate change or mental health or um, environmental regeneration in these different places that's already showing examples of a well-being economy in action. So Neva, um, you have experience working with businesses um, and thinking about how corporations should and can incorporate um, social and ecological 
uh, goals into their own corporate structure or just their own goals. And this is kind of a corollary to the idea about policy and how governments might incorporate these ideas. Um, have you seen um, good examples of things moving um, in this direction when you're talking about corporate um, citizenship or corporate responsibility for better, lack of a better word? Well, there's a lot of good talk and there are a lot of good metrics and metrics do matter. Um, so when companies measure the triple bottom line, you pay attention to what it is that you measure. And um, as the data keeps coming out, for example, that corporations with uh, a reasonable representation of women and minorities on the board do better than those that don't have those, attention is being paid. It's a slow, slow process of change. And there's an old guard that is very, very interested in resisting change. So I, I don't have lovely examples. I'd like to. Uh, several times there have been good examples of corporations that have really great goals and um, ideas, and they do very well. And then they get bought out by a big corporation and somehow it seems irresistible to those who have owned the corporation that when a huge offer for a whole lot of money comes along to buy it out, they usually say yes. The, the place where that doesn't happen is in worker on cooperatives. And that to me is an extremely promising movement which has been chugging along for a couple of centuries at least uh, and gradually making ground sometimes it ha loses a little ground but overall it's been growing it's not the perfect panacea you can have problems in work around co uh, cooperatives where there's unfairness and so forth but it's so different from the normal corporate uh, model. So I think the cooperatives are where I would look to see the best, the largest area of potential improvements in corporate behavior. So we've just, you've just mentioned that what you measure matters um, and that what you measure is what you end up paying attention to. Um, so we have a question about the a benefit cost analysis paradigm. Um, and is it necessary to view, for example, environmental regeneration in a financial investment lens? I think the person who's asking this might be asking about, you know, in order to motivate people or persuade people to do this, do we need to use the existing cost benefit analysis paradigm? Or is there some other way to make that argument? There are actually two questions there. One is how you can get investment into the right things, and particularly I've been thinking about it in uh, ecological restoration. A slightly different question is um, the cost-benefit analysis. They're not, they're not identical. So to start with the cost-benefit analysis, it's been applied to uh, environmental action in the United States a great deal. And um, when an environmental action is proposed, then if it's a, an action that would restrict corporate behavior, the corporations jump in and say, but look at cost. And um, similarly, when there is some activity proposed that might harm the environment, then the environmentalists jump in and say, look at the harm. Now, um, usually it's tougher for the environmentalists to make their case because the harm done, the environmental harms, costs, usually go out over a great many years. And if there is 
a high discount rate, which means if you say the future matters a lot less than the present, and you translate that into financial terms, something that's gonna happen in 10 or 20 years turns out to be worth very little. Whereas the corporate side of that argument usually has things that are going to be bringing profits much sooner, or they'll say it's bringing jobs and so forth. So cost-benefit analysis is a very useful tool. Um, it's easily distorted in political and economic terms. So you just want to watch who's on which side and what are they saying, and you know, think carefully about it. Now, the question of investing in uh, regeneration and other good environmental activities, that's a huge one. And I just saw a list of eight companies that are trying to uh, really investigate this very seriously. And, that, and that's just a list of eight. There are probably many more. How can our current system make it profitable to improve environmental quality. Okay, so I don't know how technically you want me to get into this, but there is the question of environmental services, which means the most famous case is New York City, which was told by the EPA a long time ago that their water system was polluted and they had to do something about it and uh, plans were drawn up for an enormous water treatment system, which would have cost a tremendous amount. Somebody pointed out that the water comes from upstate New York, and if it could be kept clean there, it wouldn't cost nearly so much. And that has been an enormous success, and other cities have copied this. So the water source for cities is a beautiful case study for where you can say, all right, here is a cost that we're gonna to have to pay to clean up our water. We could instead pay that to those who are the land managers upstream. Okay, so how do you do this for carbon capture in, in soils? That is an immensely active subject of study. People all over the world are trying to measure carbon capture and the benefit of it. This is very fast moving. I think good answers are coming out. Nobody has all the right answers yet. So just, I like, sorry, go ahead, Stuart. Um, just, just perhaps a, a rider, um, which is an interesting case I came across, Neva. Um, it's much more a subset of what we're talking about is We've got a, a big landowner in the UK called the Crown Estate, which basically holds all the land owned by the Crown, including huge amounts of agricultural land and um, also the, um, the sort of parts of the seabed, etc. And sort of, and they one of the things they used to run all their tenancies in a sort of classic way, just let it out, not pay much attention to soil quality or anything like that. But they also own a large part of um, central London. And as a property owner, they put conditions on a lease. So if, you, if a building needs repairing after you've um, let it for five years, then the person um, with the lease has a repairing uh, requirement. They've started doing the same for soil on their agricultural tenancies. So measuring soil quality um, when they let out the lease and giving benefits if the soil quality now that's not so much carbon it's more around sheer um you know quantity of biodiversity worms sort of soil quality more generally but it's an interesting concept where they've they in effect applied the same thing that people have applied for years to property to um but either charging if you degrade the soil or um or benefiting if you um, improve the soil and a more general quest thing I wanted to say just about that whole question you're saying is the importance of, when I worked at the World Bank, I worked on development banks and the old, an old fashioned, sometimes public, sometimes 
part public, part private. The idea of a development bank that can um, help seed investment, especially in, in issues to do with the regeneration, etc., and sometimes bring in private investment as well, is pretty crucial that we have those sort of mechanisms rather than thinking the market will do everything. It won't. Um, and the other thing I'm suspicious of when this whole question of valuation of ecosystems, I worry a lot if things get marketized in the sort of wrong way, you know, selling Mississippi um, pollution futures and things like that strikes me as a mad idea and very dangerous. Um, I'd like to mention uh, once again the question of the time frame that we're dealing with because the longer into the future you go in general, the more obvious it is what the environmental benefits are. And a topic which I should have mentioned it to begin with is the discovery of the health benefits of good environment. This is a very hot, growing subject. I am uh, a member of the Eco Health Network, which is helping others to find the research and publish it that shows how if you improve certain green amenities in cities, the health of the residents improve. And given the costs of health, health care, this is, this is an enormous avoided cost if you can improve health. And people are finally getting quite used to the idea of paying for avoided costs. That's been a, a stumbling block it, you know, it wasn't so easy to grasp as paying for something positive, but paying for an avoided cost is a very important topic. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So I love this theme um, that has kind of been running through the conversation about how we, it sounds like you both have uh, a distrust of the technological solution to these big problems and would rather talk about management solutions. Um, and th that could be management of the land upstream from the New York City water system, um, but it also could be management of farmland. Um, and I wondered if we could go into that a little bit more um, and maybe talk about the human, uh, kind of the labor element of that, because if you manage land more intensely, it takes more people power. And I wondered if you wanted to talk at all about that. Shall I? I'm happy to start. Um, but this is probably one Neva knows more about than me. But it's um, the first thing to say, I don't distrust all technological solutions. I'm, I'm a great believer in using, um, you know, I've been working over the last few years on the fourth industrial revolution, which is the bringing, you know, the first industrial revolution was coal um, and iron ore and things. The second was the assembly line. The third was the digital. And the fourth is really the coming together of biotech, um, digital um, and physical systems of all types. And there's, there's some brilliant stuff that can come from technology, but what we're not doing generally on technology, sorry, it's not quite your question, Alice, but I'll just touch on it briefly. Um, we haven't worked out the governance of technology or how to judge whether something is a desirable solution or a non-desirable solution and how we build ethics and, um, and values into our technology. And those, those are that's critical tasks that we do that. So I'm not anti all technology. Um, but I think there's some big issues, and I've, I've written a chapter recently in a textbook on um, the whole issue of technology and well-being. And critically, um, we've got to start thinking about what are the things that we want, we still need, or even want to improve labour productivity, increase it. And what are the things we want to actually decrease it? Because this idea that on everything we try and improve labor productivity i mean you wouldn't you know if suddenly um the lincoln center was going to pay beethoven's fifth in half the time um highly productive very undesirable would be horrible um but care work we actually need people doing more of that similarly regenerating the environment we need this idea that we've just you know through seeing agro industry and just driving down 
the costs all the time, the costs of labor, rather than actually seeing this as a brilliant way to create good jobs um, for people in make, producing good food and, and um, restoring the environment at the same time. It, it's, it's bonkers. So we've got this sort of focus only on um, labor productivity, which is very dangerous. And I think we should be thinking, as Neva said earlier, in creating a whole range of jobs. It's not just Green New Deal in the sort of classic things we've talked about. It is radically changing our food system. It's radically changing how we look after our environment and how many of us work on those issues. I think that's critical, but Neva can probably talk better than me about the economics of some of this. Well, it's very puzzling because there is the question of, of labor productivity, how much can be produced by one person. And starting with the first industrial revolution, what caused a rising standard of living was that labor productivity grew because you had more and more materials and energy available and technology available to each, each worker. Now, the energy transition is stumbling along. I'm hopeful, and in fact, I'm rather more hopeful of the, than I was when I wrote this paper originally 10 years ago. Then I saw the energy transition as a period when energy was going to become very expensive. And I don't think that's going to happen, and that's going to be a tremendous help. So if energy is not more expensive and possibly less expensive, and if technology is growing in ways that can increase human productivity. Then the, the third thing is materials. And as we have increasing resource scarcities, we're gonna to have to be more sparing of our use of materials. So there's this uh, trade-off. Now, another trade-off is going to come, and I think agriculture is the perfect example we have too few people working in agriculture. We have traded off uh, huge amounts of machinery and chemicals to augment the human labor. If you withdraw most of the chemicals, maybe all of them, and a lot of the machinery and put back people, the cost of producing food may not actually increase, although it also may. I've Right. Yeah, I think you. I think you're right, Stuart. We've yeah. been paying too little for food. The American household pays oh, between twelve and fifteen percent of its household budget for food. This is incredibly low by world statistics uh, in history and globally. Um, cheap food. Yeah, it's great when you have a lot of hungry people. You need to be able to lower the price of food. But when you do it at the cost we have of de degrading the soils, which means that food in the future is going to be harder to grow and less nutritive, then that's been a very poor trade-off. It's costly in the long term. So more people working in agriculture, higher price of food, maybe more government subsidies to make sure that people don't go hungry, there are all these things we're going to have to weigh together when we think about labor productivity. And the most essential work is low paid precisely because uh, it's work that a lot of people can do. You don't need an advanced degree to be a caregiver or a farmer. Or, well, you do need an advanced degree to run a farm these days and really know what you're doing. But a farm laborer doesn't need that. And um, maybe mothers should have advanced degrees, but that's not expected of them. Uh, although again, the young mothers I know are all studying like mad, reading things about what to do about how, how to deal with tantrums and other childhood issues. So uh, cheap labor is not a good thing when it results in poor people. But um, <clears throat> highly productive labor, when, and therefore very expensive labor, 
is also not a good thing when it is created by use of alternatives to labor, which are bad for the environment or the future or for other things. So we have a question to kind of go back to the well-being economy framework. Um, what are some of the concrete aspects of the well-being economy, um, particularly as experienced by the individual on a day-to-day -day level? What would it look like if we did live in an economy that was a well-being economy? Um, well, perhaps I'll start and leave a add in. I think first thing to say is there's not one template. I think it's crucial to say, you know, this, what matters is the, first of all, what are the goals? And I mentioned some of those, that we have an economy that looks after human needs, um, that regenerates the environment that is much fairer and makes people feel valuable and feel that their voices are being heard. Those, I think that's what I said at the beginning. That's, those are your goals. How those goals play out in different places will be different, but critically, we know from psychology, um, and I'm not sure I quote exactly, a lot of economics at the minute is based on the idea that we as humans just uh, have a, a drive to acquire and a drive to defend. Now we have those things, but we also have a drive to connect and therefore connection to other people, to the environment, to where we live, to how we're rooted is very important. And the third, the other thing psychologists have shown really clearly is we have a drive to make, to have a sense of purpose, to have something wider than ourselves. Um, and that in, that's terribly important to humans that, and it's part of feeling valuable. And so, having something that one can really believe in and um, can is incredibly motivating. I know how my life changed when I took the plunge um, in my early 40s to take my salary down by two thirds um, and go and work for a charity that I really believed in the end, rather than um, fascinating job running a, a business and turning it around. But I couldn't get excited by the idea that I was, if I was successful, yes, I was providing some jobs, but I couldn't get excited by the, this mad concept that you're there to um, increase the value per share and that sort of thing. That's not a motivating concept for a human being. So, so critically, the sort of things that Neva was talking about, you would not only see the environment being much more importantly, but you would be valuing people in a different sense of value. So you'd be bringing in this idea of how you value people, not just financially, but in all sorts of other ways. So the core economy, how you, how you give esteem to people, how you value mothers, how you value um, low paid carers, not just by paying them better, but by how you treat them. So it would be an economy that will differ in many different places, but you focus on meeting those human needs and those aren't just physical needs they are those mental needs as well and those needs for us all to feel that we're doing something of importance and our and value in our lives whatever type it is and um the other thing to say about a well-being economy is we're just doing a bit of work on this at the minute the current economy we spend a huge amount of money trying and failing often to deal with the problems it's caused because we've, you know, whether it's problems of pollution, whether it's problems of inequality, whether it's problems of um, poor health, whether it's problems of poverty. Yes, we, we throw in these solutions. Whereas if we, we try and put a lot of money in those economies and we're just actually trying to look at the fiscal benefits of a well-being economy and how that plays out, because we're spending so much just either creating problems or then to trying to deal with them, which is just wasted expenditure. So you start, a, the whole point about a well-being economy is it's driven by what's necessary for human um, well-being in the first place. And at a, level, at a pers much more personal level, I think I even mentioned that previous Schumacher lecture, the, we in 
did some work with the in New Economics Foundation, this is my previous organization, on the um, what we call five ways to well-being. In the UK, we have what you need for a healthy diet, which is for eat five fruit and veg a day. And we came up with the five things you need for your well-being at a, on a daily basis. And that's been used now, it's used very widely in the UK health system, in the National Health Service, those five things. And they are very simple. Uh, they are connect, so how much you actually um, talk to people, how much you connect with people, how much you connect with where you are. Keep active. So there's a lot, there's clear things that um, a well-being economy would help people to keep active. Keep learning. That's terribly important to human beings as well, that we keep feel we're learning. Um, take notice. That's a strange one. You wouldn't think about it, but how much do you sit just looking at your machine or do, when you're traveling in a train or do you look out the window and see what's happening in the world or and so take notice is terribly important to our well-being and the final one is give and that's the most uneconomic concept of all economics doesn't recognize giving um, as a sort of economic term very effectively and to give of your time um, your energy your um, your notice your attention and particularly of your love is probably the most important thing of all for our human well-being. And so it, this a well-being economy has to be not just what the economics is doing, um, crucial as that is, but that those dimensions become far more important and people are permitted and given the space not to have to worry about whether they're surviving. So they actually can bring out those, which they do often, even when they are trying to survive, but it gives people freedom to do those things and you find would find a lot more people doing it. I would like to just emphasize one thing which has come up before which is the issue of jobs and how essential is it to a person to have a job for their well-being. There mm. was a period in modern civilization when it was assumed that women didn't have jobs so at least women of a certain class. Um, and so a job was not considered essential for a woman's well-being. In fact, it was rather the reverse. My mother's mother had a job for a while and tried to hush it up the rest of her life. Um, and so do we want to create an economy that requires most people to have jobs? What's the alternative? And of course, universal basic income comes up over and over again as the alternative. And how are you going to pay for it? Uh, lots of questions about that. But I think it's a, a question that should stay very much open. Yeah. And I agree with you, Neva. And I, I sometimes find myself heavily weighing in on the idea of universal basic income. But other times thinking, well, universal basic services are probably as important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And also, I think, while I don't fully know the you know, I keep alternating, as I say, on that question you just raised. I think the critical thing is how we recognize and, and value people, not just financially. So it can be equally important. Somebody who's staying at home to care for people can be, can be as important if one society is set up in a way that values those people, gives, recognizes their needs to get to have alternate things happening in their life and really gives them esteem for what they're doing. Uh, whereas at the minute, so often we don't, they're invisible. Um, so yes, I think jobs of some type can be very important. And that's why universal basic income is only one part of it. I, I could look at a shorter working week. I would look at um, alternate job creation in certain areas and the way the state does that, as well as potentially considering some form of universal basic income to cover parts of that but I don't think it's one size fits all and it's there's one easy answer. So it's actually it's interesting that these are things that are really on the table in national and international politics right now um, when you think about the Green New Deal or universal basic income they're policies that are being debated when yeah. maybe 10 years ago they really weren't. I know um, that's really good that they are. I think that's pos really positive. And 
And I think the other thing that's being debated that we haven't touched on, but is also an area with lots of uncertainty is the whole question of central bank financing, you know, actually using money creation directly to um, do things you want to in society. And I certainly believe, for instance, at the minute, the inflationary risks are minimal and one could easily, in the UK, for example, the central bank could easily create money to double the wages of all our care workers uh, with no ill effects at all. So there's certain things that are clear to me um, there's other things where it's much more complicated and how, again, how much you can use that. So there's a whole area of modern monetary finance, which is a fascinating area. So when I was looking at that and universal basic income, I think this idea that a sovereign nation um, hasn't got enough money is a very questionable thing. And that's, you know, there's no, not enough money. Um, yeah, it's when one starts looking at redistribution, who actually has got money, you know, there's not enough money is something I would question very much and fight against. Well, that's something, um, the idea that it's really just a lack of imagination and lack of political will and not, you know, certain limitations that have been artificially placed on us. That was something that I think Neva brought up in her um, 2010 Schumacher lecture. Um, and I wonder if that takes us to our kind of conclusion now, if we think about um, overcoming some of those artificial limits that we've that our economy or our paradigm has placed on us, what do you think about when you look forward, and um, what are the things that are giving you hope right now? And I don't know who would like to start, but I'll leave it up to you. Gosh, do you want to go first, Neva, or shall I? All right. Um... I'm very encouraged by a lot of young people who are becoming really forceful voices for the future. That the idea of taking the future seriously is critical. And then there also are the surprising coalitions that have been coming up with the new idea that people who have been mistreated and marginalized for centuries shouldn't be anymore, that their voices should be heard. Um, the voices of prisoners, the voices of people of different colors, uh, the voices of women in places where women have been seriously or even less seriously, but still somewhat kept on. I mean, the Me Too movement, I have been fortunate. I haven't suffered the way a lot of women have. And I'm kind of stunned to discover how many women have suffered mistreatment. So uh, new voices speaking up to defend themselves is an extremely encouraging thing. And the great thing is that there are plenty of people who are not in the categories I just mentioned. They have not been mistreated or whatever, and yet who get it and are willing to stand side by side and to march with those who are standing up for rights that have been denied to them for eons. So those are the things that come to my mind as causes for hope. Yeah. I mean, I agree, Neva, totally with the, the various different social movements that are really gaining strength. Their voices are being heard, and I think they'll make a big difference. And the second thing is what you pointed to, Alice. I think we're starting to imagine things differently. You know, we're realizing that we are limited by our imagination. And I think we will see um, not just economics as a profession, as Neva's been fighting all her life and a um, much lim more limited way I have for change in that profession. I think we'll see economics shift, but I think we'll start, and if really the wellbeing economies take off, and if, as is possible, a G7 member joins them, for example, um, in, I'm actually hopeful that in five years we'll have a grouping of nations that are saying we can do things differently and i do think you know 
thinking about things like universal basic income, how we use uh, sovereign money, um, state money to pay for things, all those raise very interesting possibilities. I think we can s start to see the shape of something very different. It won't be, we're not talking about the sort of shift of the economy in the same way as communism versus capitalism, but we we are thinking, I do think we're actually in a very strict sense, looking at the end of capitalism. The idea that in a strict Marxian sense that the economy is there um, for the prime benefit of the providers of private capital is something that is fast eroding and needs to erode. And I do see that um, we'll still have a market system, we'll still have um, a system with all sorts of different types of enterprises in it, etc. But one that operates that's a, a much more mixed market, uh, third sector, fourth sector, government, et cetera, core economy, and one that operates to very different values, incentives, and it has very different institutional structures than the current one. And so I do see in strict sense, if you take the Marxian term, I do think we're looking at the end of capitalism, and I think it's a very good thing. I think we can see the glimmers of a post-capitalist world, and I think it's a much better one. Well, thank you both so much for for sharing with our audience um, and for being here and talking with me. Um, it's really been a pleasure to have you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's been and so many thoughts. Love to chat more about. But I know. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is part of our series of the Schumacher Conversations, and there will be more. Um, I think there are two more Schumacher Conversations coming up before the annual lectures. The annual lectures are October 25th. So you can find out more on the website, centerforneweconomics.org, and um, we can continue the conversation in that way, and then we can all join together at the annual lectures. So thank you, Neva and Stuart. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Alice. And thank you. And thanks to all the audience as well for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>